life. Welcome to Coffee and Real Talk for Writers, where we get real about the writing life. Writing might be a solitary activity, but becoming a successful author is anything but. So grab a cuppa, pull up a chair, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to episode 13 of Coffee and Real Talk for Writers. I'm your host, Talina Winters, and I'm recording this on Friday, May 13th, 2022. First thing um, is my comment on episode 12 question of the week, which was, what tools do you use when you are creating or refining characters? And Brenna Bailey Davies says, for my first book, I refine my characters based on instinct and beta reader feedback. With my second book, I've been struggling a lot more with my characters' motivations and how they would act. So I took a page from your book and used the Enneagram and the Emotional Wound Thesaurus. So far, both resources have helped quite a bit. And I love that Brenna did this because she's actually one of the people who inspired me to learn about the Enneagram. So yay, Brenna. I'm glad I helped you back. (laughs) Anyway, uh, before I go any further, I just want to apologize for a couple of things. First of all, my sound quality. I am not recording at home and I will explain why in a minute, but I'm basically just using a little handheld recorder that I use for dictation. And I know that the sound is not good. I tested it in a couple of locations here in the house I'm in, and this was the best one, but I know it's still echoey, and also it's going to pick up more other noises, like if I'm just moving around, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get that out in post-processing. So I mean, I know I've listened to podcasts that have worse sound quality than this, but I wish that uh, I could make it better. I'll do what I can in post. And if it's really terrible, I will look into getting um, some kind of a travel mic setup or something that's going to work for the future. So yeah, the reason I'm not at home um, and the reason why it's been so very long since my last episode actually is that the very day I was planning to record this episode... um, which was a month ago, well, yeah, it would have been a month ago this past Wednesday, so two days ago. So we're a little over four weeks ago that my dad went into the hospital. He doesn't live in my city, and he's a bachelor, and my sibling lives way far away. Um, I only live six and a half hours away from where he lives. And I'm, you know, he has siblings and stuff, but uh, I'm pretty much the person who is needing to be here taking care of things. So I, um, on the the day I was going to record this podcast, the Thursday, typically I record on Thursdays, I got in the car and I drove six and a half hours and um, I've been kind of the frontline person ever since. And um, my dad's been in the hospital ever since. He was in ICU for a couple of weeks. Now he's on just a high care unit in the hospital And unfortunately, although he's no longer critical, he's not really progressing. So we're not really sure where it's going to go from here. However, I am trying to find some semblance of normal. And I am hoping to start recording podcast episodes um, every other week again, or as often as I can. I'm definitely not going to make promises right now because basically I have now a part-time to full-time job, depending on the week, just in, in... going and and spending time with my dad and helping out in the hospital, as well as dealing with his affairs. So it's been a challenge that way. Plus just the stress has really thrown my whole schedule off. And um, we do have a pretty big family and I'm kind of the touch point communication person to let everybody know what's happening with him. So yeah, my days have really changed since my last episode and There is no particular end in sight. Honestly, a short end would mean that dad doesn't make it. So that's obviously not what we're hoping for. But um, if he he does make it, we're still looking at months of recovery. So this is going to be an ongoing thing. And my family and I are figuring it out. It's definitely not ideal for me to be here without my family. I have gone home once for the weekend and I will be going home again for the long weekend in May, which is in Canada is the third weekend. So that's next weekend. I'll be going home for a few days as well. So that's nice, but not obviously what I would love. (laughs) 
oh, there's nothing about this situation that I love. Okay, so let's just move on. The situation is what it is. Um, but right now I'm recording in my dad's office. My dad has a very hard house. And so I'm not really sure how I'm going to make a good quality sound out of this. When I was home last weekend, I did get my recording software onto my laptop and stuff. So um, I'm hoping I got everything I needed to make to make a recording and then my dad has no internet also. So then I'll be going into town and sitting in a Starbucks and uploading everything. So this is fun. <laughs> um, uh, not so long ago, I know Sasha Black of the Rebel Author Podcast had no internet for a while at her house and I feel like I can really empathize now. And the ironic thing is like literally three or four days before this all happened, we finally got our Starlink. So I had four days of like, beautiful internet and, <laughs> and then this. So that has made all of my business ch challenging for so many reasons. But anyway, moving on, I'm trying to hold the recorder as still as I can. So I don't get a lot of noise. Um, the other thing about this is that it's really weird, but like, I actually know quite a few people, um, either professionally or, or friends of mine who have also recently lost parents or close family members or both. And I don't know what it is. It's just a really weird, difficult time. Um, so yeah, if you happen to be somebody who's dealing with a high stress situation, my thoughts are with you and I would definitely always feel compassion for you. But right now I'm kind of like this blubbering mess most of the time. So yeah, it doesn't take me much to set me off. Anyways, despite the challenges, I am slowly making progress on my revisions for Every Star That Shines, my Peace Country Romance number one. And I did do some, some looking at my scheduling last week, I think it was, uh, last, or this week, earlier this week, and discovered I am still on track. Um, it's getting a little, I'm using up the lead time that I gave myself, let's put it that way. And if I can't figure out some kind of good routine, um, I am going to start falling behind. Maybe not so much on this book, because I'm pretty sure I'll be able to still, I've got lots of lead time on this one. But the next one is a Christmas story that I'm wanting to release in November. And any later than that, and... I mean, obviously there's still a little bit of time before Christmas, so I do have a, a few weeks buffer, but the more time I release it before Christmas, probably the more money it's going to make. So I would really like for it to release in November and not say December 23rd. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, and that schedule does not have quite as much buffer, but anyways... Uh, I have started brainstorming book two. Um, that's one thing that traveling for six hours, one direction between here and home is good for is that I can dictate and brainstorm, uh, notes and plans. So I did actually get kind of a rough outline of the first hmm, half of the book on my last trip. And, um, it's still pretty loosey goosey. Mostly I was just getting to know my characters a little bit better and how, what kind of situations, like the touch point situations I might include in the book. Um, I'm going to have to do some research and the, here's the really ironic thing. The, the main character in the next book is an ER nurse. And although I'll have to do the research about what the emergency room nurses are do, um, specifically in what their work environment is like. I do have sources for that. Um, I, I've, I'm friends with a couple of people who were actually ER nurses in Peace River, which is my hometown that I'm basing this, um, small town on. So I can talk to them and figure that stuff out, but it's just been so ironic that here I am. I've just been surrounded by nurses for the last month and, um, yeah, it's been super interesting. None of them are ER nurses, of course, but um, still, it's, it's yeah, it's given me lots of ideas, at least as far as the character is concerned. And also, I'm glad I started to do that brainstorming because it, uh, it allows me, since I'm still doing the uh, revisions on book one, then I was able to put a couple of things in there, more things in there that, that set up the next book a little better. So that's good. I have also, now that I'm in this situation, um, I've, I've tried dictating for my actual writing in the past and I've never glommed onto it. It's, uh, 
Something about the way my brain works, I think because it just takes me a little more time to think of things, um, I do tend to compose better fiction when I am writing it. And I do edit as I go, I think, which is part of the challenge. And so in the past, when I've dictated some chapters, um, like I, I did a fair amount of dictation when I was first starting with the Sphinx's Heart drafting. And I'm pretty sure that I ended up chucking those chapters. Now, that isn't necessarily the fault of the dictation um, so much as I was still early in the process of writing and getting to know what I needed to put in there. And the final chapters that ended up in the book I basically rewrote from scratch. However, um, I did use some of them. Uh, There was quite a bit more editing involved on those than, like I write really clean. So there was a lot of editing on those and I don't know in the end if I saved any time. However, right now I'm not looking so much to save time by dictation, but find time to write in the craziness that is my life. So I'm spending more time in vehicles than I have in years because I am going into the hospital every day and that's a good 25 minutes each way. Um, and you know, so there's that I've been using that time to listen to podcasts or call people because I need time for that too. So I don't know. I, I may not necessarily use that time to dictate because I like to have dedicated time when I'm writing or when I'm brainstorming, it just, I find it's more effective. So I kind of think that the more effective thing to do with that travel time for those short trips anyways, is still to, you know, use that time for what I'm using it for. However, when I'm, if I'm going to be driving back to Peace River every two weeks, um, that's 12 to 13 hours of travel time. And obviously I wouldn't be dictating the whole time, but that does give me the time to get into the brain space to start really thinking about my story. So We'll see. I may actually start dictating this book and just see what happens um, and maybe getting into it for in, in situations like that would allow me to develop the brain processes to be able to dictate in shorter periods of time, which would really help because I'm trying to run a business that regularly took 48 to 55 hours of my time every week. And I'm trying to do that in much less time now. And um, yeah, so any little time saving hacks I can start to use would be good. Uh, Besides the writing, I have actually been doing some a freelance assignment and I've been uh, in the process, I was already in the process of doing uh, some coaching for someone who wanted to learn to write book descriptions for her own books. And that has been really fun and rewarding. And I'm also really glad I've had that work because, um, I don't know, just even doing that has kind of allowed me to the, to escape the situation a little bit and been good for my mental health. Speaking of mental health, I might bring my dog back with with me next time. (laughs) It's weird living alone folks. I've never done it before. Um, I've always had like a roommate or something. So this has been different. Okay, so today's topic, which I probably should have mentioned up at the top, but I did not think about. Um, So my book description client actually had asked me a question about timing because this is her first, she's publishing a series, but it's her first indie publishing project or publishing project of any kind, actually. And so she was, she's been picking my brain a little bit, which I don't mind at all. I love helping my clients Um, on their publishing journeys, whichever route they're taking. Of course, I'm much more experienced with indie publishing, but I do know some things about trad publishing just simply from listening to a lot of trad published authors talk about it over the years. So, um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be giving any advice on this podcast about trad publishing. That is not what this is for. This is for indie publishers like me. So yeah, my client was asking me basically about timeline related issues as far as when to do what in the publishing process. And I do actually have a series of blog posts on my writing tips blog that does talk about the indie publishing process, uh, basically from the moment you hit what you write the end on your first draft until your book is out in the world and you're marketing it and things like that. But it's definitely high level overview and I don't go into 
the depth of the actual timing of each thing in the, in that blog series, I will link to it in the show notes. However, um, today I'm going to actually tell you like, this is literally what I do when I am planning my timeline. And this is still going to be kind of high level. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds, but if you have any questions, please leave them on this post and I will answer them in future episodes. Okay. So every auth- indie author works slightly differently, of course. And, um, even trad publish authors, everyone is a little different, but there is kind of a general process you can follow. Now I write slowly. Uh, so I want you to be aware of that going in. However, listening to other authors that write quickly, um, say like those who are releasing a book every month or every few months, sometimes they speed up this process or sometimes their process takes about the same. It's just that they're working on multiple projects at once. Um, so like one author I know who releases quickly, um, I'm actually friends with her editor and she basically, she writes the book. She has her editor edit them. She does her revisions. She, I don't even know. I think she does a copy, copy edit. And then she just releases it. Like I don't, but she's writing so much that that is her marketing strategy. Because I write slowly, I need to be a little bit more economical with my marketing strategy. I need to be able to build up some buzz ahead of time before the book comes out so that people are actually expecting it and want it. Um, and because I write slowly, that's easy because I'm literally talking about it almost the entire time I'm writing. Um, as you've been hearing me talk about every star that shines and I've been working on that since December and that's not coming out until August, but now I'm starting to talk about now this is, this is a craft podcast. And so, yes, I'm telling you about my projects. Um, but I have mentioned that I've started drafting or started outlining the second book in the series to my newsletter already. And right now I'm only releasing one newsletter a month, by the way. Um, I was doing two weeks for a couple years though there, and I definitely have enough content to be able to still release every two weeks. I just don't have the time. And I was struggling once I started this podcast, I was struggling with finding the time to release a newsletter every two weeks. Cause I also, I'm trying to release a knitting newsletter once a month for my knitting business. And yeah, there's just only so much time in a day and I don't want to spend my entire life working. I spend enough of it working as it is. Much as I enjoy this, there's other things I also enjoy. (laughs) Anyway, let's get into the actual timeline here. And this is a rough guide of my typical timeline if I'm hiring a cover designer. And, um... I have started making my own covers for certain things for my contemporary romance, especially. However, eventually I would like to probably go back to hiring cover designer. I'm just doing that right now because I'm, I'm having to be a little bit more lean in my business. And also, um, I'm still struggling to find one who I really enjoy their style and that I work with well. So right now I'm just doing it to save money and because I can, it was one of my goals a few years ago to learn to be able to do it well. And I think I'm doing okay because my two contemporary romances that have my own covers on them are, they're selling well. So (laughs) I think I, I nailed it. They're selling much better than the covers that I had on them before, which were designed by someone else. So Um, okay. So when I am starting a project, I write a working book description before I even start outlining the project. And I haven't actually done that for my, um, my, my second book in my romance series yet, but I'm just about at the point where I'm about to, like, I'm still just kind of working out those conflicts because I'm really, really early in the process of, of drafting it through. But I, um, I'll probably do that like when I actually sit down with pen and paper or or with my computer and start outlining for earnest in earnest that would be the first thing I would do is just write that working description to make sure I have all my conflicts in place and um I have something that's actually intriguing to me and usually in that process I'm refining those conflicts even further and making sure that I understand what my story is about. Then I run that by some people in my target audience to see if I'm onto something. And if they say, I want to read that right now. And I say, sorry, you're going to have to wait nine months. (laughs) I'm used to saying that, (laughs) but I do love to hear that. I want to read it now, get writing. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm going for when I, when I'm doing that, then I outline and start drafting. 
about halfway through my draft, which can be months into my project, depending on the length of the project, I commission a front cover for the book. And I'm specifying front cover, that's the ebook cover, so that I can start um, marketing it with the cover. Um, so when you, like I, I put almost all of my books into print unless they're too short to be printed. Like if they're a novelette or something, then I just keep them as ebook. Although eventually I may put out a collection of those or something, but then that would get its own different cover. Um, so yeah, I, I want to have that ebook cover right away, but you can't create print wraps for your book until almost the very end of the process. So when you're hiring a cover designer and you know that you're going to put the book into print eventually, you need to tell them that up front. And the reason is when you're creating a design file, uh, you need a whole lot more room uh, on the file for um, a print wrap, like even just the bleed. And I don't know if you don't know what bleed is, uh, when something is printed at a printer, they print it on a bigger piece of paper than, than you're going to have it on afterwards, because you, they need to be able to run that uh, ink right to the edge of the paper, right? But I'm sure that you've had some experience with printers. You can't run ink right to the edge of a piece of paper on an actual printer. So they print it on a bigger piece of paper and then they trim it to the right size. And that section they trim off is your bleed. And that's also why um, things can be a little bit off on your book cover sometimes, especially with print on demand. But uh, for the most part, it's pretty good. Anyway, so you need to tell your cover designer when you hire them, it's like, I'm getting an ebook now and I wanna get a print wrap made later. And you may even pay for the print wrap all at the same time. They probably have a print package. And so then you would just pay for it all at that time. But then when they're making their files, they can make sure that they have the room and that they're also keeping that overall design of the entire book in mind, which is going to make a huge difference to the kind of cover you can get in the end. Now, if all you want is an image on the front and just solid on the spine and back, no big deal. Um, but some genres really um, lend themselves well to having a, a cover that has a design that flows around from the front to the back. Or say if you were going to be getting a dust jacket, uh, and if you if you know that in advance, tell your designer because a dust jacket takes even more space to have those little flaps go into the inside of the print book. Um, and then also audiobooks. Now, most print designers, I think, well, I, I shouldn't say most, the ones I have worked with uh, keep audiobooks in mind right from the start. And so they're designing kind of enough space in there to create a square version of your cover, but that's not a guarantee either. So um, if you just plan to eventually be able to do everything for your book, then you won't be left out in the cold trying or scrambling, scrambling trying to make a do, get a new design made later. But yeah, so you're gonna get the ebook, or I get the ebook cover made about halfway through my first draft, so I can start that uh, promotion with the co um, cover. And I know some people like to do cover designs or cover reveals and stuff like that. And I do kind of like a little mini cover reveal, but I never make a real big deal about it. I'm just like, hey guys, I got my cover. Here it is. And uh, I'm always super excited about it, but I recognize that my readers are not nearly as excited about that cover as I am because <laughs> they have no idea really what's in the book yet. So they don't know why that cover is meaningful, but if it's beautiful, they will like to look at it just like I do. And also then I know that I'm going to be able to start imprinting the branding of the book into my readers' minds. And it is a way to tease the contents of the book a little more and get them more excited. Um, so yeah, I just look at it that way. Um, also at this point, I would make a bare bones landing page on my website with that cover and um, my working draft description. And um, so then I would have a URL landing page also that I can start incorporating into uh, marketing materials and um, sharing with my readers, etc. cetera. And that just makes it easier to talk about the book. When you have a landing page for your book, it also makes it easier to um, for other people to see the information they need about the book, especially later, um, and by the way, I recommend you always have a separate landing page for every book in your series, as well as a series page. Um, 
and again, this is just for marketing purposes for when you're talking to like bookstores or libraries, if you're going to do signings or whatever, uh, there's just all kinds of reasons for it, but also direct sales from, from your website, um, is becoming, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many authors are going to jump on that bandwagon. I've always been on the bandwagon, but it's really be having a moment right now because of some recent interviews on other podcasts. And I, I listened to one of them, which or listened to uh, six figure authors. They interviewed Katie Cross a couple times who I'm fine. I found very inspiring as far as this is concerned. I need a lot more books to be able to do what she does, but um, I'm still a, a strong believer in direct sales. If you have an individual page for each book, then that's where people would go to actually buy the book, generally, depending on your setup. Uh, by the way, um, I had this, I was saying this to my client, but I also just want to say it to you that, uh, you know, once you, once you have that landing page, you have the cover, then you can start creating promo graphics to start hyping your book. And you do not have to be a professional designer to create some really beautiful graphics nowadays. Um, there are, of course, the two mo main popular uh, apps you can use for authors. One is Book Brush, which is specifically for authors with books. And then there's Canva. Now, the dis disadvantage with Can Canva, even though it's got um, maybe a lot more templates overall, it is not designed for authors and it's not designed for books. So in Book Brush, they've got a lot of um, pre-made 3D kind of cover templates. So you can just put pop that ebook cover in there and then you can smack it on and make it look like it's a print book already. You can make it look, uh, you can actually have it on, on like an iPad or a phone or whatever it is. And it's just a matter of a few clicks to do that. They have a lot of pre-designed templates. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and then you, yeah, uh, it's, it's a very, you can, there's actually a free version, I think, or there's a very economical subscription to get a lot, basically get a li unlimited downloads on them. And, uh, they will sometimes have sales on that subscription as well. So keep an eye out for that. I do recommend it. I use it all the time, even though I am skilled in Photoshop, um, Making 3D books in Photoshop, I have found to be a huge pain in the butt and I never got good at that. So this is a huge help to me. So sometimes what I'll do even is I will make 3D versions of my books in BookBrush and then download just those images with the transparency intact and then use those to make other graphics in Photoshop. But most of the time for most of the graphics I make, I just use BookBrush and it maybe takes me most of the time about five to 10 minutes per graphic. Um, it does help that I have some design sensibility, but you don't have to, as I said, they have tons of pre-made templates already. You can just swap out, uh, images and you're good to go. Okay. So we've got a cover, we've got a landing page now, and we probably have some promo graphics under our belt that we're able to use on social media and other places for starting to talk about our book in our newsletters. So after the first draft is complete, so for me that can take anywhere from a few months to a couple years, <laughs> depending on the length of the book and how involved it is, um, I make a revision plan. And so what I mean by that is I, I decide, I mean, I basically, I think through my book and re and think about the problems that I already know are there. Cause I tend to, as I, as I write, I sometimes come up with better ideas and, and sometimes, um, if it's going to affect the plot a lot, I will actually go back and incorporate those right away so that I can write forward from that point. But if it's something that I'm like, well, this is going to affect the plot, but not so much that I need to fix it before I can move forward, I will just make a note about it and then I will fix that in revision. So, um, and there's sometimes other things too, just like, you know, like remember that I changed this guy's color, eye color to blue or whatever it is, like stuff like that. I'll just make those notes as I go, like, especially for the really unimportant stuff. And I will just find them when I'm revising. So when I make a revision plan and, and the first one I really did this for was the Sphinx's heart. Cause that was a very long book and I had a very short turnaround time to get it to my editor. Um, so I'd fortunately already had 
a developmental critique done on the first three quarters of the book. And she'd pointed out one or two issues that I hadn't thought of and I needed to address. And then I also knew about a lot of the issues that I was going to need to address. So I sat down and I spent like a few hours just really going through everything and going, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this and deciding what, what from the critique that I didn't need to address or that maybe she just didn't understand and I, because she didn't read the first book very recently before that or I I mean you know, like there's there's some stuff that she that wasn't bang on and uh, anyway so and that can happen but so point being I just went through and I made this plan for a few hours and then I just literally worked through it chapter by chapter because I was sending that book chapter by chapter to my editor or section I wasn't sending chapter by chapter but I was sending it in sections um and because I was just basically working ahead of her through that <laughs> epic, epic book. I recently got an interview, or not an interview, a review on the first book in the series, The Undine's Tear, about the review said something like, this book says it's an epic fantasy and that them's the facts, folks. I'm like, oh gosh, wait till she gets to the second one. But she was, she was excited about it. It was quite a good review. Um, I was just chuckling about it because I'm like, yes, the first is epic and the second one is epically epic. But anyway, okay. So after the revision plan, I revise in a single pass um, and then I send it to my developmental editor for a critique. And I usually send it to my beta readers at the same time if I'm using any. And beta readers, at this point in my career, I'm usually using for specific things, um, depending on the book, what it, what the book is about and what I think it needs, and maybe trying to address my areas of, like, where my knowledge was a little thin. So this, for Every Star That Shines, um, it's based around the local kids' theater production in my town. And even though I've been involved in the production, I haven't been involved in the aspects that my character was involved. So then I sent it to um, several people, some, several of my friends who are more involved in running the production, and they did give me some really good notes. I mean, it wasn't a ton of stuff that I missed, but it was enough that I'm glad that I sent it to them. And also because they're quite familiar with story, they served as my story feedback and critique beta readers as well. Plus I did get a developmental critique. So, and then I, at this point, will also refine my working blurb or my book description to the final draft. And if creating a pre-order is part of my strategy and I haven't already put one up because I might have earlier if I thought the timing was good for it, but I will definitely do so at this point when the first draft is complete. And if you're not sure when you should use a pre-order as part of your strategy or not, um, I would check out the group, the Facebook group Wide for the Win. And there's also a book Wide for the Win. And I believe both of them address... Uh, well, I know that there's a lot of advice about pre-orders in Wide for the Win. I also would recommend, I think Joanna Penn's um, Successful Self-Publishing would, talks about pre-orders because there are times to use pre-orders and times to not. And so I wouldn't say you should put a pre-order up for every book. You definitely should not. In fact, I've only done it twice. And one of the times I definitely regretted it. Um, and that was for Sphinx's heart because I kept having to move it and ended up having to cancel it once. Um, but there are times that it's worth, worth it as well. So yeah, um, uh, maybe I'll talk about pre-orders more in another episode. Not that I'm the expert. That's why I'm recommending you go check it out with other people who have done it a lot more than I have. Anyways, once I have my feedback back from my beta readers and my, uh, developmental editor, I revise again which is the stage I'm at with this uh, book I'm working on right now. Then I send it to a copy editor. And if I know the draft is already pretty clean, I also send it to my advanced readers in digital format only at that point. And I also make it clear that this is not the final copy so that they don't ding me for typos. <laughs> because some, some people have a really hard time overlooking those even if they know it's the final, not the final copy, they will still sometimes feel the need to point them out. It's like, it's okay, you don't have to do that. I'm hiring somebody to do that. But on the other hand, copy editors miss stuff too. So it's, it's, I'm not complaining. I appreciate those too. 
Anyways, but you can also wait and send the ARC copies out after the copy editing has been done if you have time for that in your schedule. Um, I judge the amount of time I give them to read the book by how long the book is, but I try not to give them too long. If they have more time, they just take more time and more people forget to do it. So um, I will give them usually between four to six weeks. Even for longer books, I try not to give them more than six weeks. And uh, they, I can either do it during that time frame when you need them to do it, or they can't and they can tell you. But even for people who say they are going to do it, expect around a 20 to 40% review rate from your ARC readers because life happens to everyone. And I think that's probably something that surprises a lot of um new authors is you think you have this ARC team and you're going to get 100% people on your ARC team review and that is just not the case. Eventually over time you're going to get a core group of ARC readers that you know are just, they are in for it and they will totally, totally review for you if they say they will. Um, but at the beginning there's going to be way less people review than actually take a copy of the book and a lot of those people aren't even going to have read the book because let's face it, this is your career, not theirs. As much as they love you and help and need to help you, stuff happens. Maybe they said they would do it and then their dad went into the hospital and they ended up having their life go into disarray. So you just, you never know what's happening in somebody's life and you just need to always be kind and gracious and you can send prompt, prompts to remind them. I always just ask my ARC readers now, it's like, if you have something come up and you can't do this, just tell me, like, I don't mind. I just want to know because I, I want to keep me, I want to make sure that my art team are actual people who, who will review. And so, um, I've started to get a little more strict on it now than I used to. It's like, you, you have to prove to me that you're actually leaving reviews by sending me copies of reviews that you've left. And so that I know that you're actually not just here for free books, but anyway, um, again, art teams, probably the subject of another episode. Okay. So when I get the copy editor feedback, I revise one more time and I create all the front and back matter, or I do that while I'm waiting for my copy edit to come back. And then I get the manuscript, bleh, the manuscript, I get the manuscript form formatted for print. Um, the reason is that, and the reason you can't do it until then is you need to know the final page count of the print version before you can get your print wraps made. So, um, once the manuscript is formatted for print, then then you can get your print wraps made. So then you would go back to your designer once you know what that final page count is and say, okay, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, so you do need to have some ISBNs for each format of the book before you get your print wraps made. And I do recommend buying your own instead of using the free ones offered by some platforms like Amazon because then you can use the same ISBN for each format of the book on all the different platforms. Um, if you use a free one provided by like Amazon or I think maybe Ingram Spark or even not sure, draft to digital might even provide free ones, but they're essentially only good with their platform because they own those ISBNs, not you. So I know that in the United States, ISBNs are not cheap, unfortunately, but it's just a business expense. You have to just plan for it going in. Um, in Canada and some other countries, Singapore, I think is one of them. And I don't know how I know that, but, uh, I, I just think that they do. And I'm not sure what the UK does, but basically in Canada, you get your ISBNs for free. So you just, Go to Can Library and Archives Canada and you create an account and you can get like, I think you get a basically a bundle of a hundred at a time. And so that I think they're still buying you bundles. So that's why you get bundles of certain number of numbers before you have to renew again, but it's not like it's, it's still free. So it doesn't matter. Um, anyways, you need those ISBNs. And then what you do would do is you would use your ISBN and your final page count number and you'd get templates, cover templates from whichever uh, distributor, distributor or printer you're going to use. And so then it will, then you would send those templates to your cover designer and then they're going to be able to finish making your print wraps based on those templates because the templates have all the measurements that they need. By the way, um, at that point where you have had your copy editor feedback back and you revise again, you still need to get a proofread. 
Now I have sometimes, depending on the situation, had my PDF proofread, but that was because I was revising the print version of the book. And I was, I was wanting, I was tired of reading the book and because I, it was a republish and I did not want to read it one more time. So I hired someone to proofread the PDF for the specific things that I knew a print design book needed to be checked for. And also they were checking for other things at the same time. But usually I just get the EPUB proofread because I make these from the same file uh, at this point if I'm not republishing a book. And um, honestly for myself, I usually do this myself, but sometimes I will hire someone or my mom has a really keen eye, so she'll do it for me. But proofreading as a copy editing service is usually the cheapest form because it's very fast. And you just want to make sure that if you're getting, usually your proofreader is going to be somebody different than the person who's done all your previous editing so that they have a fresh eye. But they do need to know about uh, decisions that you've made with your copy editor about style and usage, things that are, you know, because every every project has some things that's like, well, we just need to know what your personal style is because this is a choice. Um, believe it or not, grammar and punctuation and stuff has has options sometimes. So <laughs> you just need to be able to tell your proofreader what those are and your copy editor should be able to provide you a style sheet that you would just pass on to your proofreader so they can just double check those things as they're going through. Um, but uh, definitely on the PDF, you will need to look over each page of that to check for formatting issues. And when I say formatting issues, there are specific things in book design that you should know about before you get your book put into print so that you can check for those things. Um, stuff like they call widows and orphans, which is like lines at the tops and the bottoms of the pages that aren't the full line and, and things like that. There's actually quite a few things. And there's a whole book about this called The Book Blueprint by Joel Friedlander. And I highly recommend you read it because um, that will really help you create more beautiful, more professional looking print books. Even though you're not the one creating them, you're still the final checker. If you're the indie publisher, you have to do that publishing job of creative art design and also um, the final proofing there of the design. Okay, so by that point, you have your ARC reader feedback and hopefully something that will make a, pull, a great pull quote for the back cover from that feedback. Now, your ARC readers actually don't need to leave reviews until the day you release, but you can ask them to send you them you their reviews in advance to hopefully give you some, of, especially if you're sending it to somebody who is like someone established in the field, uh, like another author in your genre. That would be a great person to ask them to send you their review in advance to hopefully, hopefully they know how to write a review that will allow you to pull good um, marketing copy from it so that you can use that on your landing page on your website. You might even be able to put a little phrase from it on the book cover itself. Um, I find that to be less effective on in indie publishing, but it can be helpful for print books. And um, yeah, I mean, it's mostly just helpful when you're promoting it on places like social media and on your web page and things. So then you can get your designer to finish up your print wraps. Okay, so then at this point, you can load the final versions of your books to all the sites, including your print distributor. I use Ingram Spark, but some, a lot of indie authors use both Ingram Spark and uh, KDP Direct Publishing. I just personally have had a problem with the quality from uh, KDP Direct, which is also known as Create Space, because that was what they used to be called. So I don't use them for that. I've had some other issues with them as well. Um, I'm not saying I'll never use them. I just don't right now. And um, yeah, uh, you can you can always try it. You can load it up on KDP and they will send you, that's one of the things they do that Ingram Spark doesn't is they actually send you one free author proof copy to look over, which is what I did and was very unhappy with. I'm like, nope. We'll stick with Ingram Spark because Ingram Spark still distributes to Amazon. Um, it just, you don't have as much profit margin uh, on any book sold on Amazon as you would if you were using uh, the KDP direct printing. 
because of course they're printing it. So they give you a slightly bigger cut than somebody who's third party, but you still get, you know, the same profit margin with Ingram Spark through Amazon as you would with any other book distributor they, or any other retailer they, they distribute to. So it's, it's not really a loss. It just means that your profit margin is going to be a little smaller through Amazon only, which admittedly is going to be where most of your sales come from. So, you know, you do have to weigh this yourself and decide what your priorities are. One word of caution right here is that, uh, Ingram Spark thinks that they can distribute uh, uh, ebooks, but no indie author who's ever done it thinks this is a good idea. And I'm one of those people. When I got started, I I was doing my research and I thought, oh, this will be easy. Ingram Spark does both print books and ebooks. I'll just have them do everything. And man, do I wish I had never done that. Um, Ingram Spark is th- there's problems with getting the books up onto the platforms in a timely manner. Anytime you may need to make changes, it takes forever. And also you're then not eligible for any promotions from any of those platforms that, uh, that people who are native to the platform do, uh, that are, that they can get access to. And then, uh, when I, when I was trying to take them down, that was another pain in the butt process. So don't just don't ever publish an ebook through Ingram Spark. If you want to keep it simple and you don't want to learn a whole bunch of platforms all at once, start with draft to digital because they are a very easy to use platform and they will distribute everywhere for you. And at any time when you're deci- you decide you're ready to go direct to another platform, you just simply uncheck that box in draft to digital. In my understanding, it usually only takes a few days. They've taken it down off of that platform and then you can put it back up directly yourself. However, that being said, as intimidating as it seems when you first start out to go directly to all the different selling platforms, mostly they're not that different from each other. And it's only a matter of the time to learn the ins and outs of each one. Um, one that is super, super easy to start with is Kobo. And so, you know, they're like, they're almost easier than draft to digital, which is crazy. It's just that they only distribute to Kobo. And then you can also get to overdrive, which is a library lending service through them. And I want to say there's one other one, but I don't remember what it is. Um, so anyways, you could start off with Kobo and Kobo also gives you 70% on all of your pricing points. Unlike, uh, you know, one specific humongous retailer we could mention anyways. So draft to digital does take 10% for their service fees, but they only take 10% if you actually sell something. There's, there's no fee to use them. You can just, you can just start. And then if you sell a book, then you pay them a little something. Uh, now most experienced publishers, self publishers, uh, who, who are doing this themselves will use, um, draft. They'll go direct to, to Kobo, KDP, Barnes and Noble, and Google play. And then they'll use draft to digital digital for Apple and all the other services that you can get to through them. And the reason for this it to use Apple instead of going direct to Apple is that believe it or not, um, the way Apple works, they don't, uh, offer promotions to just their general indie publishing populace. Very often you kind of have to know someone at Apple and have a relationship with them. And usually you have to be a fairly big seller, I believe to get to that point. So, uh, the nice thing about draft to digital is that you can ask them to be informed of promotions and then they will tell you when promotions are available and you can apply for them. And that's actually the best way to get into Apple promotions. Most of the time also, uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt to try and deal with Apple directly. I've heard. And also I'm not an Apple user, so I believe it. It's been kind of interesting, even just learning how to use, um, how, how to access my listings on Apple sometimes, uh, again, wide for the win. The Facebook group has some really great tutorials about how to do all of this stuff. So if you are not part of that group, please go look it up, look in their tree of knowledge, search the group. There's so much information in there and, um, you can get started with this fairly easily. Just give yourself a few hours for each new platform you want to learn. 
and get started. And if you get started on this earlier in your career when you don't have very many titles or you only have one title, it's really not that intimidating. <laughs> um, I know I mentioned it a few uh, episodes ago that this new tool that I haven't actually tried yet, but I was updating prices today. I was reminded of it. I don't remember what it's called here. It's a Chrome extension called wide wizard and it does actually reduce the amount of time copying information into new platforms so you can look at that up as well if you use chrome um, and it will save you time when you're uh, publishing on to the different direct platforms for wide stuff that didn't make sense you got it though right right okay i am almost done i promise by the way, the just one last plug for Wide for the Win. If by chance there is a topic that you cannot find in the Tree of Wisdom and you cannot find by searching the group, you can ask a question and you're going to have answers very short order. Uh, there's just, I think there's like 10,000 authors in there now of uh, varying degrees and everyone is super helpful. It's one of the most uh, positive and helpful communities on the internet, I'm pretty sure, for our indie authors. So, uh, and the nice thing is too, like everybody there has different business models. So you can find somebody who has a business model that you think would be a good fit for you and then pick their brain a little bit. Okay, so I mentioned that you get a free author copy from Create Space. You do not get that from Ingram Spark, but you can order at your publisher rate, you can order a copy or several copies in advance to, te to test the quality and make sure that it turned out the way you wanted. And I highly recommend you do this. I haven't personally had a problem with them ever myself, but I have seen some authors that have, especially in the craziness of the early pandemic, there were a lot of complaints about their quality going down and their customer service going down. And I think they've addressed the issues that were causing that now. Uh, I haven't heard about any of those complaints recently. Um, but yeah, you have to, again, you just have to make these decisions about what's best for you. Uh, I would allow about two to three weeks to get those proof copies in, especially if you're not in the United States. And if you're doing any release day promotions or giveaways, you'll want to order those books in advance so that you're ready to ship out to your winners on time. So now I have a really high trust level for Ingram Spark after using them for all these years and, and never having that kind of problem. I mean, I've had a few botched books, but I just want anyone listening to realize that in any print run, even from like a, a offset printing or whatever, they actually have like a margin for error of a certain number of botched books. I can't remember what it is, like 2% or something. It's not super high, but you just have to understand that if you're going to order in some bulk books, there's probably going to be a few that are going to be mm, maybe not usable. And so you just have to budget that in. That is just part of the process. It's part of the cost of doing business. And you are a business, so you have to realize that there's going to be some loss. That's just the way it works. Um, it does suck, but it is the way it works. So anyways, as I said, I have a high trust level for Ingram Spark, and my process, I, I, I usually have really short publishing timelines by the time I get to that point. So I often order these as my proof copies like I like my giveaway copies are also my proof copies, which it, that would mean that if there was something wrong, I'd have like half a dozen to a dozen books that mm, maybe weren't super usable. But there's always, I mean, unless there was a, a huge problem, I could find something to use them for. Like I can give them away to uh, people who have helped me with like research or whatever, or I could donate them to local silent auctions or something like there's always something I can use them for. I, I mean, I've rarely had a book that was just so bad that I had to chuck it. And um, I mean, it's happened, but <laughs> again, super rare. So I just, and because I'm in Canada and it takes time to get here anyways, I just order my giveaway copies. And those are also my proof copies that I just check for to make sure everything's good. Uh, with Ingram Spark, these are not marked any differently because they're just publisher copies, but just be aware that with Create Space, they put this huge band around the cover that says, do not resell or not for resale or something like that. And so you can't actually use them for anything else. You can't give them away to things like that. So uh, yeah, just be aware of that. So anyways, if you're doing this for the first time though, I'd, I'd make sure to allow some extra time to get 
a proof copy and then ordering your giveaway copies because you want to make sure that you know what you're doing because things that can go wrong aren't necessarily the printer's fault. Maybe, um, maybe your print formatter screwed up and you get your proof copy and you realize that the margins were too small or you can't see something like it's all tucked way into the gutter or something like, like there's things that just because you're new and you're learning, it's going to take some time to make sure that you're confident that you have the skills lined up, right? Maybe your cover designer didn't allow, allow enough room for bleed and your title is going off the page, stuff like that. So that is pretty much the end of that. Um, generally for myself, I allow about six months from the moment I type the end to my publishing date. And that's kind of long for indie authors actually, but for tra traditional publishers, instead of six months, it's about two years. So I think in order to do this process correctly and to make sure that you do your due diligence in all those steps, you have to realize that it's going to take some time and, and editing just takes a lot of time, um, whether it's yourself or like, like your own editing process will take some time, but depending on your personality, maybe that's something you can binge right through, but your editor that you hire is not going to binge right through your editing. And if you want them to do a good job, you're going to need to allow them the time that they need to do it properly because they usually have more than one project on the go or, you know, maybe they're doing it part-time or whatever, like editing is actually a lot of work. So make sure you allow the time that you need to get everything done to a, a high standard. Okay. So this week, the mug quote of the week, um, it's inspired by a quote by Roy T. Bennett. And the original quote is, it's only after you've stepped outside your comfort zone that you begin to change, grow, and transform. And I just thought that was applicable both to what's happening in my life right now, but also to just the process of indie publishing. Basically, um, I don't know of anyone who went into indie publishing and just wasn't publishing scared or just like having to grow a lot to learn all the skills that you need because it's a huge growth curve. And so what I'd actually put on a mug, this is my, my version of that is, excuse my mess, I'm being renovated by change. So uh, the question of the week this week is what's one thing you wish you had known before you started publishing? And you can leave a uh, comment to answer that on my uh, podcast blog at talinawinters.com slash real talk for writers or slash podcast. Either one will get you there. And you, or you could tweet me at Talina Winters. And I look forward to hearing from you and I hope you have a great week. Thanks for having coffee with me. Coffee and Real Talk for Writers has been produced by Talina Winters. The music for this podcast was written by Josh Rickard of joshrickardmusic.com. You can find episode show notes, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you're feeling generous, buy me a coffee at talinawinters.com slash podcast. And be sure to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Tell your friends to come by too. The kettle's always on. So until next time, I hope you keep writing and keep it real. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.